Okay, what I want to look at today <coughs> is a completely different sort of area uh, from much of what we've been looking at before. Yeah. And one of the pr problems we're noticing more and more and more is that our software is getting very, very, very fragile. It's more fragile now than it has been ever since we started inventing the darn stuff. If we go right back to the very early days, everybody, because it, you were effectively programming in machine code or assembler, fairly low level languages, and the machines were amazingly lacking in power compared to today's sort of capabilities. The complexity of what we were doing back in, say, the 60s was much, much lower uh, than we have now. We were very, very careful to constrain our designs to the barest, barest minimum. And with the levels of complexity that we have, or simplicity, really, that we used to have, it was not so difficult to be to be able to sort of inspect by eyeball the designs and even the code. <coughs> Once we started developing cleverer things like spreadsheets which bring programming to everybody, people were using spreadsheets to collect data, to analyze data, to do stuff in an environment where one of the programmers, the users, weren't properly trained in design and uh, programming and logic. And secondly, and probably even as, mo as important, there is no known way of actually printing out all of the, the algorithms of the formulae in a way that you can then inspect because if you put data in this cell you don't quite know the sequencing of the uh, calculations as the black box called a spreadsheet just kind of executes in some fashion the sequence of formulae and during the 1990s early 2000s there's quite a lot of work done looking at the levels of errors in spreadsheets. And the results of those uh, explorations, shall we say, suggested that any reasonably useful spreadsheets of more than, say, 20 by 20 rows and cells, it turned out that there was about 95% 90, of all such more complicated spreadsheets tended to have at least one, if not more, fundamental errors. Mm -hmm. And most of those errors were likely, in most circumstances, to be of significance to fundamentally change the management judgments and decisions. If you then looked a little bit backwards to see why this was happening, typically... A, you have people who are not trained in systems analysis and coding. Secondly, spreadsheets are designed, or, well, permit a mixing up of data and formulae. Thirdly, most significant spreadsheets tended to be developed on the fly in the middle of an urgent problem solution yeah. so that there was never time to empty the data out, start off with blanks or zeros everywhere and then start populating with various test data like put ones into everything and see what happens, it actually looked right um, and so on and so forth. So they were never properly tested because, and I've worked in areas where the result was required for seven o'clock tomorrow morning going to the board. And you've got three or four people, often relatively recent graduates who are the grunts in these sort of business areas, yeah. 
and someone has sort of corralled them at about th two in the afternoon with this incredibly urgent thing, go to bed when you've finished it because we've got to email it or whatever. And so you'd have three or four people sort of hacking the spreadsheet together, collecting the data, feeding the data in as it arrived, without checking the data, without checking the formula terribly effectively. There would be a sort of delivery of pizzas and uh, pe uh, pep coke or whatever at some sort of, sort of six or seven o'clock in the evening, and um, a refresher at sort of eleven or twelve o'clock, and people getting more and more and more tired and more and less and less careful. And so these things just happened. There was a, a very interesting uh, piece of work done that I put in touch with by someone from SAS, I think it was, about eight or nine years ago, which mapped out the formal information gathering and processing system for a big insurance company. And there were about 25 layers, I think it was, of spreadsheets all interconnected using the connector data outside this spreadsheet to that spreadsheet. <coughs> and it mapped not whether or not they had errors, but how the essentially procedural processes linked them together and ver verified them and allowed them to, or were these locked or were they unlocked spreadsheets and how much ability did people have to fiddle. The other part of what's happened in the last 15-20 years is that formal operational systems are almost always put through at least some form of software test, formal software testing process with formal software testing engineers doing the job. But what we see, and I was talking a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, to a group of um, software testing people, and it turns out that although this is the case for their company's formal operational systems, when we get into the field of the application of analytics, this very, very rarely happens. It is very rare that a formal, formally trained software engineer, testing engineer, gets involved in their analytics platforms. So we have a situation where we're using enormous amounts of software, which is even the f more formal systems is pretty fractured. We had the report yet last week through Tech Republic of the fact that the lack of connectivity and connections between the various to tools and apps and platforms we use are driving a, a lack of productivity or a failure of productivity of the order of 32 days of lost productivity per working uh, year. And that's kind of about 12.5% for those who are affected. And it's partly because the software doesn't connect, it's partly because the software breaks or doesn't do what we need it to do. So it seems to me that we need to think about this thing about trusting our software, can we? At the, back, at the bottom of it all is we know we have far, far, far too many system failures we know and have known for many decades that other than for incredibly trivial types of systems, we cannot capture perfect requirement specifications. There are always holes. There are always, and this is where in a simple situation where we're just effectively mechanizing an existing set of processes or re-engineered processes uh, that we will sometimes, the users will sometimes get the logic wrong they, because they don't have perfect memory. We do not have perfect memory as humans by and large. 
Our typical process has been always, at least in the formal uh, waterfall type of approach rather than the agile uh, prototyping approach, we spend a lot of time with the business, the business analyst and the systems analyst spend a lot of time with the users capturing requirements, whether it's with UML type of stuff or, the old, or whatever. Document what the users are telling us, then reflect it back to them formally and informally to confirm that this is what they really said, they really meant. Then goes the system designers and so on and so forth. If it's something that's already been done, we have probably, I don't know, a difficult to say what the probability is, but we have a fairly high chance of getting most of the important requirements captured. What we've seen over the last, and I guess it's probably 10, 15, 20, 20, 25 years, is we've been moving more and more into areas where there is nothing at the moment, we may be creating new processes, uh, new ways of working, and so the chances of capturing accurately what's required becomes even less because we aren't even relying on memory because there's nothing to remember. We're trying to design the stuff on the fly. What this means is, is it's incredibly difficult to verify and validate the front end of the requirement specifications. Before we start creating the code, so we basically create the code based on the best guesses of inaccurate requirement specifications because we can't verify or validate them. We then produce the code and then we put the code through the unit testing, integration testing, etc., and so on, all the way up to the final user acceptance testing. Now, we do this is where the software test engineers come into play. And we now know that for reasonable types of systems, there is no, it is very difficult to mathematically prove that the code that's written is error free. Even internally, just as software, does it do what it, it's supposed to do because of the um, the, the, the mathematics of levels of complexity are so high that we just can't actually do it. And so they have to produce lots of scripts, lots of test data. A lot of test data is often done, created, um, based on what the spec says. And it is not always based on live data or copies of live data, it's just random data that's there to test the validation and decision trees and so on. Which makes it very difficult when the users get involved who know the business, they know the data, they know everything else. And if they see this significant value, then the result will be this. Whereas if you've got random A, B, C, D, E, F there, I don't know what it's supposed to be over here. And so we have a series of issues, even where we have formally specified systems. If we're doing uh, agile with co-located teams of the users, and the best experts in the business for the users, the, all the various software designers and coders and so on in this sort of agile, iterative, prototyping type of environment, there is, in some respects, less opportunity for formally testing in the way that we used to do it with the waterfall process. It's still done, and it can be done. There are ways of doing it. The test engineers will typically put together uh, a whole raft of test scripts which are designed to both prove that existing functionality has not been accidentally changed and that the new functionality is, as far as can be determined, is working correctly. However, when we start looking at all the analytics-y sort of stuff, we don't see 
any of these processes, or very few of these processes being put in place formally. If you go and look at the big data analytics teams using SAS or any of the other big tools, almost inevitably you've got the data scientists doing their stuff. And there, are, there seems to be no sign of the formal test engineers being involved to prove the stuff. So that's kind of the background. Go back over history. <coughs> A few fascinating and pretty high profile catastrophes. London Ambulance Software, you're probably aware of that one. Denver International Airport baggage handling, which for about two or three years, the whole system didn't work. Uh, it wasn't the operations research type modeling new. At the very beginning, they didn't have the, the capability or they thought it was extraordinarily challenging anyway. And it, the international, the airport basically was cocooned for some years at an enormous operational cost for not, not being able to open it. When Egg, the internet bank, launched here in Derby back in the early 2000s, they got their um, load capacity balancing completely out of kilter and the system went down within an hour. Too many people trying to get into it and it sort of collapsed. They had to go and build a bigger server farm and put load balancing, load shedding software into place at the front end. And it, they were out of action for a week or two. What was interesting with that one is that that happened, say, fairly early 2000s. And then about three or four years later, the National Births and Marriages uh, organization put all of the, or a large chunk of birth and death certificates online and suffered exactly the same meltdown within an hour and a half of starting up. They hadn't learned from the egg situation. There was no load shedding. There was no nothing. They eventually, when they came back up with load shedding on, they also had a maximum of 15 minutes activity and so on. So we didn't even learn the lessons from that. We know that over the last five, four, three or four years, the iOS upgrades have become more and more fragile. And to the extent that the uh, Tim, whatever his name, the guy who runs uh, Apple is saying now they're going to start really co going back to concentrating on getting stable up, uh, new, new releases um, for iOS what, 11, I guess, will be the next one, that they will not try to overload it with functionality just to take advantage of capabilities of the new, next generation of the thing that they're going to go for more stability. We've known for 20 years with Windows that you never take the first release of Windows uh, new release. You wait until Service Pack 2 or 3, probably. <coughs> Do you remember Night Capital? five years ago. Night Capital was a high frequency trader in the States. These are um, share trading platforms who basically arbitrage price between different uh, exchanges around the world. They invest enormously in ultra high speed connections. They will drill literally a laser line between, and that one company did between New York and Chicago to shave milliseconds or microseconds off the transmission time. So they could see the price, the purchase price there and the sale price here and say, oh, I can make a, a cent per share or half a cent per share if I can buy 100,000 now and sell it in two seconds. They had put an upgrade to a new algorithm or to one of their algorithms and they, they did some funny things. The net, and they had, I think, 12 servers involved in this thing. And they managed to upgrade, I think it was all bar one or two of them. They missed out one or two, which held the old algorithm, not the new one. Because for some reason they were reusing some uh, indicators or something else that would say which what algorithm to, to work with. And they hadn't fully hadn't checked that they got a perfect implementation across all of their servers. So they had 
let's say, 11 doing the right thing and one doing the wrong thing, they didn't know it was going to be there. And they switched it on at go live, at sort of whenever the exchanges start working in New York. And in less than 30 minutes, the rogue algorithm, which shouldn't have been left lying around, had basically bought four or five hundred million dollars worth of shares in the wrong way, and it took the company out. It was rescued by a uh, competitor. Um, the owners of Knight Capital essentially lost every last penny they had. It was, uh, and it, this was in about 30 minutes of, before anybody realised what's happening. It happened so fast. Do you remember when Kingsway Retail Centre Roundabout was re-engineered a year and a half ago? That was fun. Do you know the one I mean? No. Uh, okay, right. Just across the way over there, it had worked very nicely for years and years and years, little roundabout on the ring road down, uh, and there's a one, one leg off it down into the retail centre, but they built a whole lot of housing uh, and decided they need to have a bigger roundabout with traffic lights so they could feed the traffic into the and out of the uh, housing centre. Made the roundabout in the centre a little bit larger and put lots of traffic lights all the way around with pedestrian crossings. When they switched it on, the lights on, it brought that whole area of Derby to a grinding halt. You... If you unfortunately got into the shopping centre area, where you've got St. Ridden Home Base on one side and uh, TK Maxx and Boots and so on on the other side, those two car parks locked up. It, was, it, took, it could take you an hour and a half to get out. Mm -hmm. They kept this up for about a week or so and then decided, this is all too complicated, we'll switch all the lights off. And the positioning of the lights, which was designed, I think, probably for pedestrians to come across yeah. the road from the shopping centre. Now there's about two people a week, or a day, possibly, actually walk all the way across. <coughs> Most go round like that, out of the shopping centre, and don't need the lights. They can't, at the moment, without completely <coughs> rebuilding it or repositioning all the lights, have individual traffic, uh, pedestrian crossings, because the lights are right on the edge of the roundabout, so it's inevitably going to see, seem as though it's for controlling traffic around the roundabout. And that, so that they couldn't, didn't model it, they couldn't get the sequencing right, they lost too much time doing the um, switching, so that they just built up enormous queues and it doesn't work. Then there was, if you go back to the test magazine in July 2016, there were some problems with an fMRI scanning software which really fouled up and didn't do the right things. We know we've got put security failures on every platform, the amount of stuff being nicked is amazing. We know that as we move up into the AI sort of field, we've seen Top Gear cars where Jeremy Clarkson nearly got run over by um, the Mercedes, which didn't stop when he stood in front of it which is a little bit like what happened back in, two th in 90, the 1980s or even the uh, 1970s, 1980s. Um, some mechanised, automated equipment in Rolls-Royce and one of the machine shops uh, where they're carrying around big piece, of circular piece of metal about like that, discs, fan discs and uh, turbine discs between the machining centres on little robots. And they had little bumpers that would supposedly stop them if people got in the way and the manufacturing director was demonstrating to a group of um, VIPs and said, look, it ever so safe. Stood in, in front of it and expecting the little bumper to touch it very gently and then stop, but uh, it very nearly ran him over. It didn't stop. Uh, we know that um, with the Google cars are having fun and games, and we know that Tesla is still having serious problems. A car that went under the lorry because they, they thought it was a bridge we had the car three weeks ago that ran into the, at 60 miles an hour into the back of a stationary fire engine and so on. So a lot of problems, and these are just some of the more spectacular and interesting ones, I guess. So why did they all happen? What's going on? 
Well, if you actually start looking through it, we have all this list. We, the specification often doesn't reflect the true need. It's often a problem of the Pareto problem that 80-20 you do 20% of the functionality to giving 80% of the task workload. Denver failed because of incorrect algorithms. The British Airways turn off five problems with the algorithms and other things. Lots of missing features. Security is a great case because security is traditionally the very last thing you add in. You don't put it in until you have to. Unit and integration user acceptance test failures. Often stuff doesn't turn up, doesn't, isn't noticed until the very last minute, you know, a week or two before go live then the sky falls in, the test data is wrong, inappropriate, etc. Machine learning and AI gets more interesting because most of the really interesting machine learning AI type systems are remarkably opaque black boxes, which we kind of understand at a high level the mathematics the matrix algebra in neural networks. We know kind of what it's intended to do, and we kind of understand if it, how the training process is intended to work in terms of the, here's the input, and then the sort of cycling through the data with all the feedback loops helps it to refine the weightings of the various factors in these horrifyingly high order matrices and vast numbers of them. So we understand the principle of what we've designed these networks to do, but we cannot follow through to identify why this specific set of data gives this specific answer. We also are beginning to discover that we don't fully understand some of the critical parameters in the training pr process in terms of the consequences on the actual stuff that is learnt. We know from things like LASCAD that the human computer interface factors can have fairly significant impact. And we also have on our mobile phones and on many, many apps that software is in a permanent state of beta. There is no such thing as a production sign-off. And we see this as in, in our uh, app stores, updates for our smart devices, a continuous heap. Every month, almost all of our apps get an update, and some get one twice, so twice a, a month. And th there's a very strong uh, impression that the developers think, Oh, well, if it fails, we can put another one out in another week or two. But also, the other thing is that if you look at 1970s, 80s, 90s operational software for businesses, a lot of them would have been, here it is, this is what we want it to do, let's go away and leave it. If you look at the project management software system that I led the development of at Rolls Royce in 1985-86, 87, once we had delivered it in eight, within the 18-month delivery uh, process, essentially it did not change for 15 years. But commercial software, they they because you buy it and you're paying, you know, sort of maintenance. Uh, charges and so on, they feel a desperate need to keep fiddling, to add functionality, and not helped by the user saying, oh, could we possibly just do this and just do that, and which also leads to lots of other issues. And you see it with things like Google Maps, it just keeps changing every three to six months. Somebody has a in the Google Labs has come up with a nice news thingy and it, suddenly we find things have gone, the settings have gone around. So it used to automatically stay with, say, traffic being indicated all the time. Now you have to go click on it every time you go in there, almost. <coughs> so there's this continuous 
churn, which has other consequences as well. Now let's have a look and see what we're trying to do. Somebody has a need. Somebody then said, oh, okay, right, we can go fix that. Let's, we need a bit of an architecture, we need a design, we need some data, hardware. What data? We don't know for sure. We need to create some code, we need some testing, might go back again, and eventually we release it to production. And then you go round and round and round. And we know that typically we have all the time in the world to get it wrong first time and then fix it the second time, perhaps if we're lucky. But we never have the time to do it right first time or the money. And yet, Whilst we were using the waterfall processor through the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we knew that 75% of the system's costs were post-implementation maintenance, fixing right second and third time, and then keeping it up to date, reflecting modern and the changes to the business world. A simplified approach, but still. We tend only to start picking up the problems when we're trying to verify the coding to make sure it's working and then validating the system against the user requirements and user acceptance test which is incredibly late in the day. This is where it gets really expensive to fix problems and yet now this is a long way down the development cycle. Modern software is getting more and more and more complex very, very complicated, so many options, so many uh, different paths through the systems. And if it has been modified and updated over many years, like for example the Microsoft Office products, because of the continuous need for forward compatibility, or sorry, backward compatibility, it is very rare that anybody goes back into the old code to remove replaced functionality. And so, and you can see it with the way, for example, that Word works. There are five or six different ways to make text go bold. And many of them probably are separate paths and what, how it chooses to go through that path or that path is kind of probably quite random. Hence the undisclosed design feature that if you highlight a chunk of words, in a document and then press the bold uh, button, there is a random probability that it'll do the right thing, just boldify that highlighted section of code or of words, or else it'll make the whole of the document go bold and you un then you click on the undo and be gad and be gora, you still got that bit bold and all the rest back. But it's also added a spare line feed in the footer or the header wherever the, the um, page number is kind of bizarre but it's so complex no one has actually recreated stripped out all the alternative paths in terms of the requirements what not the documented requirements these are the real requirements we're talking about now in validation of user acceptance testing because the users will not go back to the documentation because they've got in their head their model of what it should do not what was documented. And so this makes life even more exciting. And the system developers get really tetchy because they then say to the user, but look, this isn't the docu what's documented requirements. Yeah, I know that, that the user said, but this is what we have to do. This is what we actually do. And you know, your guys didn't quite capture it. We didn't notice that they hadn't quite captured it because we knew what we meant and we read the words to mean what we thought we wanted and so on. And then you end up in sort of the DevOps agile type of approaches to compa potentially compound the problems. Because there's less than the word documented, because that's what agile isn't meant to be, supposedly. And the DevOps approach then further compounds the whole thing because that's designed to release rapidly. Which business wants to get the stuff up and running as soon as possible because of all these time pressures of the global market and everything else and meet the competitor. But the user maybe doesn't actually want to have stuff changing under their feet every 
sort of five times a day or something. He's kind of getting to the crazy. So we've got all sorts of fun stuff here that makes life more and more complicated. So what, is there anything that we can go about uh, to try and achieve this? And fundamentally, I think there are a few issues. We need probably to have a more holistic approach in the way that we address our problems. And if you think about the old rapid application development, the prototyping, and today a proper implementation of the agile frameworks and concepts, co-located teams, users, and developers, and architects, and security, and everything together, there is potentially a better way of doing things. We can't completely solve the problem of human memory, mm. at least in the West. So we still have issues about verifying and validating the requirements capture up front. Traditionally, we, the teams have always been ever so keen on getting the functional stuff sorted out and specified. But the non-functional stuff was kind of left much less clearly developed. Uh, security particularly tended to be well, whatever we could manage. And if you go back to the 70s and 80s, it really didn't matter that much because no one could get access to your networks. <coughs> but as, as X400 email started happening, and then the internet connectivity, etc., it's become much, much more important. And security, we now know, is catastrophically bad in the way it's implemented. And that's where GDPR ultimately locks in because it kind of is bring, going to bring security by design and for default much higher up the agenda. Otherwise, you don't have a defense when you lose vast amounts of data or go out of, um, or stop being operational. And we need to be thinking about, as well, the HCI side, the human computer interface, the interface design, uh, much more. And there are some signs that this is being addressed by some teams. And Tesco have quite an interesting group, apparently, that looks very much at the customer experience CX or UX design. But the other thing that is very, very intriguing is that since the 80s, perhaps, As the complexity and scale of the software kept growing, organizations have more and more tended to heavily constrain the budgeting for projects in terms of numbers of people, in terms of money, in terms of time scale. And where the teams have actually come up with probably quite reasonable estimates that are achievable. The project sponsors have come back with that indrawn breath whistle and then said, reduce it by 30%, everything. And we know an anecdotally that these sort of project sponsors at the back of their mind know that this is not entirely sensible. Uh, because they say, oh, well, yes, but this is, we, we need to have a challenging target to, to keep the noses to the grindstone and so on. But the Standish Group report through the chaos report since 1994 shown pretty conclusively that if you go into a project like that, you will not succeed. You will not be on time to budget, delivering a functionality or business benefit. You will fail you'll be late over budget and so on. You won't deliver the required functionality or business benefits, or you will just shut the project down completely. And we know from history that only 30 percent of projects ultimately succeed. 
My take on that, stop launching so many projects. Of, the thir of the, those you would normally previously have launched, cull them down to 30% to one third and properly fund and resource and in, in, in time scales as well. If you can use agile prototyping, that might well increase your probability of success. But reduce the numbers of projects dramatically. And my experience is fits in with that all the way across, that we should be doing that rather than trying to get all of the projects we want. Uh, just say, okay, these are what we wanted to have, well, that was probably that, 200%, cut to 100%, which is what we would have launched, work out what the budget is for that lot and resources and so on, allocate that to just 30%. And I think that would be probably much, much more successful. I've talked a little bit about the 12, 13 Vs of analytics, big data, but it turns out that if you use these Vs as questions about what you want to do, they also apply to systems development. The, the first three, volume, velocity, variety, were the original definitional Vs for big data back in 2002 and 2003. They added another one from I, by IBM, the value word, in about 2004 or five. But it turns out that if you look at all of those, they actually provide you some very, very interesting questions as a framework for looking at your projects, looking at your analytics, your AI, your ML, and your traditional operational systems. All sorts of useful things. There's a little bit of um, information at the URL there at the bottom. So these could become, can become very powerful sets of questions. <clears throat> so if we start thinking holistically and look at one or two of those Vs, the value one is very important. What is the real value of the project? What are we expecting out of it? And as we look more into the analytics, ethics, trust and governance sort of side, does it what value does that data that we're trying to use have? Do we understand our data? Do we know what it's about? Particularly as we go and start grabbing data from outside, trying to bring it in. We tend to know about our operational system data because, hey, that's what we do. We may, if we start thinking carefully, do a few little pilots, explorations of the data, be able to discover that actually, we can develop new business models. And I was involved in one uh, at Rolls-Royce back in the late 80s, which is to look at the data coming off the big jet engines, uh, which were initially was designed to help the air, airline engineers identify developing issues in the engine so they could fix them without the engine braking and having an un planned engine removal or unplanned maintenance. Over the last, where are we, 30 years now, it has totally changed the airline uh, engine business model. Airlines don't buy engines any longer, they just rent them off the manufacturers uh, with what's called the total care package. You pay X dollars an hour, a flying hour, X dollars for a takeoff perhaps as well, and all this data, a terabyte of data per engine, comes off each engine at the end of a transatlantic flight, goes back to the data center, and the engineers at, at Rolls-Royce and Pratt and & Whitney and General Electric look at it, and working with the airline say, this engine will need to come off wing at such and such a point in time, or you can do an on-wing module change or something. And it's totally changed the way the business works. There are signs that the on or off machine tools, uh, sensors for machine tools, it may change the business model for, me, for that as well in, in, over the next few years. So that if you're making widgets, you only want to pay for the, basically some costs relating to the widgets you manufacture. You don't want to have this million dollar 
piece of equipment on your capital balance sheet, just want to rent it, lease it, and pay a royalty to somebody who will come fix it when it breaks, preferably identifying ahead of time that it's going to break. We also have organisations like the Human Resources who are thinking, if we look at the data we have and the collecting from our staff in terms of all sorts of parameters, and so there's some interesting stuff on Kaggle uh, data sets, looking at why do people resign from their job? There are thoughts that there's some, there is data there that can help us to identify people who might be at danger of resigning, which is a problem because we don't go, go out and hire someone and train them and so on. So can we proactively identify situations which might lead to two people wanting to resign and so on? And that could be quite valuable. There's other perspectives that we can reduce the number of people involved in screening job applications, using modelling techniques, uh, profiling techniques and so on. So have a look at the data, find out what its value is, what is going to be the value of the project. Vulnerability, well we have the questions of security, reputation, if you lose 75 million sets of data mm. your reputation kind of gets a bit of a hit. In the future under GDPR that kind of can get very, very expensive as well. We also have problems with systemic and systematic errors. We know, for example, that some of the AI tools are fundamentally biased. We have the um, racist face recognition systems. We have the racist uh, profiling systems that the police are using, not designed to be racist, but because they haven't thought about the data they're using and its co-correlation with race, ethnicity, or gender or something. The velocity one, well, that's how fast the data coming at us, how quickly do we need to make decisions, can we do, do we do it on the fly or can we wait till next morning, what drives us in all sorts of technology choices, both for primary operational systems and for analytic systems, as does volumes, number one. I remember if, when I left Rolls-Royce in 2000 odd, gigabytes were our larger sort of size and the idea of having a few te uh, terabytes of data for the um, what was it the data warehouse was thought to be an interesting challenge terabytes at that stage now we have half a terabyte on one of those and and more we're now into the uh, petabytes and hex exabytes as our uh, as things have changed with Moore's law so we need to be thinking much more at the beginning about those sorts of things Veracity is another interesting one. Veracity, the, the veracity problem is that, by and large, something like 80% of our data that we have around of us is of uncertain veracity. We don't really know which bits are right and which bits are wrong. And we don't really know, for the, for the stuff that is wrong, how much is it wrong. You know, there's stuff like location data. Individual readings of time sequence, sorry, individual readings can be even more difficult to verify. If you've got one photo location tagged, you really have no way of judging it. Only if you've got a series that you can begin to make a judgment. You can't easily cope with sensor calibration, very, uh, except over time. Um, and some sensors drift faster than others. We have problems in the technology stack. We are now looking at with things like um, blockchain technology, which is essentially a, a list or a chain of transactions between party A and party B transferring value or doing a smart contract to do something, a small smart contract. And we, all we know with the blockchain process is that once a number gets into the system, it cannot be changed. Or if it is changed, it's very, very obvious to everybody. 
What we don't know is whether the data that's got into the blockchain is correct or not, because humans are often involved, or it could be an IoT type sensor, and we don't know for sure whether that IoT sensor is reading accurately. But there's a number gone in there. With all of the technology stacks around us, again, chunks can go missing. Uh, with blockchain, which is supposed to be resilient to almost all forms of failure, if I am part of a supply chain management system in, say, Africa, as one of our students pointed out yesterday, what happens when the power fails? Because I can't get in the bottom of the stack, or the top of the stack, whichever. And we know that software fails. We know that, so by implication, all smart contracts in, the system, in these uh, blockchain technologies, there is a possibility that those smart contracts are not going to execute correctly, as intended. They do something, they complete, but is the output what is expected or required? When we are connecting a large number of sources of data together, are we sure, can we be sure, that the connections are correct? So the most common name in the UK is John Smith. So is the John Smith in my corporate database the same John Smith with that Twitter handle, or that Facebook profile, or that LinkedIn profile? How can we make those work? Can we do it in an automatic fashion? Or do we have to have huge manual uh, exercises? I mean, we already know, I mean, I've got examples of friends who, kids, have applied for uh, student loans and grants and so on. And the student loan, student grant system has confused them with someone, with another student kid who has the same names and the same date of birth. And they got cross-linked. Within businesses, because almost all of our systems have grown in silos, and even where, at some stage, organizations have gone for a single ERP system, like, say, SAP or Oracle or PeopleSoft, at the beginning, back in 2000, uh, 2002, 2003, 2004 sort of thing, by 2017, 2018, they've probably broken those single uh, systems up into best of breed with multiple databases. We have lots and lots of data dictionaries which say part number or sales value. But if you look at the real meaning of the sales value in this system compared with that system, they are different definitions. And so when you start trying to do some analysis, unless the data analyst recognizes or is aware of these different meanings, they may well cross-link them and you get a wondrous fruit salad of results because we can't guarantee the veracity of the data or of our definitions across the system. If we look at something like SAS, SAS has something called a model factory. And the idea there is you're trying to, you've got a whole load of operational data that you want to be able to pour through the system and come up with an algorithm that models fairly accurately the data and the decision making that humans did. And you can fire it up with, up to, say, probably about 20 different algorithms, different logistic regression and, lo uh, and regression models, and, 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 and tell it to go work over the weekend and come back with a report on the accuracy, the fits, and so on. And it will rate them in terms of the best representation and probably identify one or two that a human needs to go look at as well. If we look at this, and that could be, I mean, we're looking more at the predictives through the model factory in SAS, bog standard predictive analytics type of tools. 
we have with machine, other forms of machine learning and deep learning and neural network based stuff, we have even greater issues because we don't even understand what's going on inside them at a detail level. Because humans can't hold in their heads thousands of high order matrices and weighting factors and so on, it's kind of impossible. We have issues, one, with the training data. Is it fully represented, which is probably one of the reasons why we have these colorblind face recognition systems and so on. And it turns out that the training data for many of these is heavily male white um, biased and very heavily biased against female black and, by, and across the full spectrum of color as well. So probably not fully representative. Often we have no true idea of what's being learned, and you can think about that uh, tank recognition system which never learnt about tanks, it just learnt about deserts and forests or sunny skies and so on. We also are beginning to become aware with the, a lot of the machine learning, deep learning, beginning to get some suspicions that even the sequencing of data might have a factor. We're not sure yet, because mm -hmm. people aren't reporting on this yet. And I think that would be a very cool piece of work to do at, at time, some time. We know that SAS recommend, and from SAS uh, Global Forum discussions and keynotes, and from IBM as well, and their customers, that they will recalibrate most of their models about every three months based on the previous three months worth of data. Now what's kind of interesting there for me is what are the consequences of moving from this set of this model to that model and this set of weighting factors to the new set of weighting factors over the weekend. What's it do? What's it doing in business terms? For you as a company, what's it doing for your cl clients, your customers? And I don't think anybody has ever thought of looking at that side. Which leads also to the sustainability of the model question and the stability of the decisions that are being made, perhaps all by automation or perhaps just by management judgments based on the analysis. We don't really know what's going on. There is additional, there are additional aspects of the training process particularly for deep learning neural networks and so on because they reprocess the data many many times changing things a little bit every time every sequence through and again there are indications mostly um, through word of mouth rather than formal publication that if you change some of those learning parameters by not very much, it changes the success of the learning process quite dramatically. <coughs> the anecdotes tell us that what is, if, it's, if you use this set of parameters, it's alleged to be very accurate. And some people are saying, well, when we actually tried it with this and this, we didn't learn anything at all. So is that, are the successful models, uh, training models, or successfully trained models, are they just accidents? Do we understand what we're doing, why it happens, and so on? Because we certainly don't understand, other than it, the test data has confirmed it's doing something that's related to the, um, the training data. So we're having some very interesting issues where there isn't any verification or validation even of them. Ooh, it's processed the test data in the way that we think it ought to have done in terms of the categorized outputs. Now, DevOps and Agile are for rapid incremental delivery of functionality. Now there's an interest, in object-oriented programming, there's an interesting 
principle called Parnas's principle, which is essentially that no object shall communicate with another object except through the defined APIs, the defined boundaries, which is very like the formal Fortran function and subroutine libraries of 40, 50 years ago. A different way of doing it. Basically means you don't have an, op an object sneaking through into another object set of data uh, other than through the formal processes. Now it turns out that some development teams operate precisely the same principles at human communication levels. You are working on this little chunk. You will not talk to the people over there who are doing another chunk. If you need their data, you assume you will assume that the specification is correct and that the interfaces are correct. And the result of that is that UAT tends to be fairly chaotic because people aren't getting a broader picture of what's happening over there, what changes might be happening over there, and so on and so forth. And so <clears throat> applying the Parnas principle at the human team level is probably a very bad idea, but it's been used. Uh, I've heard a lovely story about that kind of reinforces this, that a very big pan uh, corp inter, um, global corporate company was developing something quite big, interfacing sort of most systems in the company together for something. And one of the programmers from upstairs, which is where the programming team were, software team were, came down to the project management, program management team level, and sort of was horrified at the level of noise as everybody was talking to everybody on the program project management level. And the program, the senior program manager said, oh, yeah, what's, what's upstairs? Oh, we don't talk to people. We just get on and go to And when they, in, I think they got to this sort of integration sort of about four weeks before go live, when they started to do the full UAT, and the amount of problems which popped out of the woodwork, lack of integration and so on, which could have been solved if them upstairs had nattered, was amazing. And with the agile DevOps, you know, always the software's in beta mode, and errors will get fixed as soon as we can do, and hopefully while we're fixing a problem, we might not introduce any new ones, but I wouldn't bet on it. Today, the test engineers verify the code, possibly, to spec. If you're in Agile, what is the spec? Is there a spec? It's kind of interesting. But we're trying to do stuff, at least in the formal operational systems, we're trying to do a fair bit of that verification uh, and validation. After the event, admittedly, but we've never properly, formally validated the requirements, the system. Probably not even formally validated the software specs as it happens. It's only after the event, which is kind of very odd, which leads to the conclusion that probably we have no good reason to fully trust the software that we have around us. And that's the formal stuff. If there are no specs in the um, analytics space, can we, how, to what degree can we trust what's going on? So we think about SAS and R. They both have a large library of procedures, functions, and so on. In the open source world, there is a degree of belief of an almost religious nature that because it's open source and there's so many people involved, then it ought, ought to be correct. And yet we know that it's not. In the SaaS environment, we know that 
they put an enormous amount of effort into the whole formality of getting the procedures properly done with proper REMA or in proper anything else. And we also know that they do extraordinarily strong and professional version control so that once a procedure has been fully signed off and verified and validated and everything else, we can trust that if the input meets the requirements, the output will be correct. You've still got the data step for mass massaging the data as you effectively do for data manipulation in R, where you've got your own coding. That's up to you to verify. If you haven't got the formality of specifications and uh, testing and so on, how do we know that those data steps that are doing the data cleansing are correct? And really, this is the, the, the final point, is how are we in the world of AI, big data, machine learning? How are we going to ensure uh, better that, that those systems which we're creating actually work, actually do what they're supposed to do? And, do, and, particular, and I think this is one of those very important consequences of the GDPR. In terms of algorithmic transparency, is that we need to become very, very much more formal in the specifying and testing of all <coughs> of our analytics. <coughs> and that will be a fairly major change of direction because it isn't being done. I mean, I, I, when I presented these slides in a different form a year and a half ago of software testing north in York, I heard a very interesting uh, anecdote from a company that produces software that is, licen is licensed out to clients in the life science forensic sort of environment. And most of the software goes through formal specification design testing process with the company software test engineers heavily involved. The, one of the research teams who was developing some gadgetry discovered, decided that they could do some analytics on it and got some stuff put together. And it looked excellent really interesting insights that the, and they sort of sold the concept to the I think chief exec saying here is look at this stuff it's really fantastic we really ought to package it and license it fortunately at that stage the CEO s decided to refer the software package and project to the formal software testing team before launching it out into the big wide world and they discovered a little glitch that the answer that the software came up with depended very critically on the sequencing of the data that was presented to it, even though mathematically there should have been no difference in the answer, whichever way you presented the data. It was sort of almost as irritating as the average of 50 points which should be independent of the sequence turned out to be highly dependent on the sequence it was easy to fix but the data scientists hadn't bothered to check so and that would have been life probably would have been life threatening if it had got out like that so we need to do a lot in terms of test, specifying and testing our stuff. So when you get to, if you do a project in this sort of data analytics space, <clears throat> one of the things that for your dissertation, you will need to use a version of the dissertation outline or template, which allows you to do a specification, requirement spec, 
and testing schedules and so on and take that good practice back into the big wide world. Okay. So think on that and uh,